I have a chapter in this book titled A Tour of Washington. I had two tours in Washington in a sense. I was a summer intern in the White House when that meant something a little different. <laughs> One difference was I was paid. And at the Council of Economic Advisors, as a matter of fact. And I remember my first day in Washington. I flew overnight through Atlanta on the cheap Delta line, airline out of LA to Washington. I got out of the cab. It was, I hadn't slept at all on that flight. I got out of the cab at the old executive office building. And I looked, and there over the old executive office building was a huge Soviet flag. And I just had little enough sleep that for a split second I thought, oh my god. <laughs> they took over overnight. <laughs> and then I saw people kind of walking normally along the street. And then the thought was, uh-oh, invasion of the body snatchers. <laughs> No, uh, no, no. So I went to the old executive office building and checked in. And while I'm waiting to be allowed in past the Secret Service, I ask one of the Secret Service guys, you know, about why the Soviet flag is there. And he says, oh, because Brezhnev is in town. And we're doing it as a courtesy. And I thought, wow. Brezhnev represents the most murderous regime, murderous regime in history. And in fact, they haven't admitted even that they've murdered, let alone apologized for it. And we're putting up his flag. I wondered, what other tyrant might come to town whose flag we would put up. I didn't have to wait long that summer. The green flag from Iran was up as the Shah visited. And as I went through the day, I noticed that people, when I'd asked secretaries, senior economists, anyone about this, they didn't seem at all surprised. They, they, it was just normal course, but this is what you do. Which made me go back to the body snatchers again. And, and I realized that Washington was going to be a strange place. <laughs> and that was, the, that was the summer of price controls, when the price controls were causing all these shortages. And I have a number of stories about that in, in the book, about how I tried successfully to avoid working in favor of, of the price controls. Uh, and then I went back again in the early 80s as a senior economist at the same place, Council of Economic Advisors, and I had other experiences there. But I started that summer with an unsettling thought but I am an empiricist. It's one reason, by the way, I've never been an Austrian economist. Sorry, David. They're not, they aren't nearly empirical enough for me. We're, we're just empiricists. <laughs> and, and I always like to look at the facts and not just go with uh, a priorism. Not just go, you know, not just theory, but look at some facts. And so I didn't start out being positive of this, but I was wondering this. I was wondering, does government care about us? Does the gov do government officials in their day-to-day -day activities really care about us? And I was starting to think they don't. That's what I was starting to think based on things I'd read at the start of the summer. By the end of the summer, I was, had an even higher probability on the idea that they don't. And then I went back there in the 80s for about two and a half years and came out positive that they don't. <laughs> and I have a that my chapter is titled A Tour of Washington. And, and the analogy, here's the analogy that I have with, with Washington and with government generally. It's a movie that they keep showing endlessly on American movie classics it's called The Getaway with Ally McGraw and Steve McQueen, where they're bad guys, but they aren't quite as bad as the other bad guys, and they're fighting over the loot. And in their fighting over the loot, they're, they're, they're destroying lots of property held by innocent people. I would guess $50,000 worth of property at least, an elevator, a bunch of cars, et cetera. And they don't care about the property they're destroying. And about the third time I saw that on AMC one night, I thought, you know what? That's the government. <laughs> the government does things because it's pursuing very narrow ends. The government officials are pursuing their ends. And they don't care about what would we call it? collateral damage. Uh, good example, steel quotas. Economists have estimated that steel quotas designed to save US jobs cost the US economy, cost the US consumer, $750,000 a year per job saved. That's a year per job saved. And a job is a $40,000 job. Why? Because they are focusing on the interest group that wants those jobs. They don't care about the consumers whose interests are dispersed and don't even, aren't even aware of the cost to them. And yes, <laughs> they buy them off instead. And so, that kind of, for me, stands for a lot of what government does. Government, we, we hear that government has incentives to take account of 
everything. But in fact, it's just the opposite. Markets, if, if things are privately owned, markets take account of everything because someone has everything, at, each individual thing at risk. But if governments are making decisions and they don't have to pay the consequences, they don't take account of everything. In fact, they don't take account of much. And there are many examples like this. And actually, I think this gets me to civil liberties. When I wrote this book, I didn't anti No, no, that's not true. Let me see. I wrote an article in Red Herring in November 99. I urge you to check my website, www.davidrhenderson.com, and check an article called Booming, How Booming Cannons Hurt Booming Economies, in which I anticipated something like a terrorist attack that would kill a few thousand people. And I even anticipated that one of the big things that would happen then is a push to remove civil liberties. I guess I didn't anticipate that it would be so quick or so massive. But I think that's what's going on is government has this very narrow end. At its best, the narrow end is to prevent future terrorist attacks. That's at its best. But in fact, if you look at the details, each agency coming forth with its pet program has its own narrow ends. So for example, the FBI comes up with carnivore, which by the way, they had come up with some years ago. And they aren't just going to use it to go after terrorists. They're going to use it to go after lots of people, including maybe people in this audience, maybe people watching it on TV. The Office of Homeland Security basically was set up based on a draft that had been created over the last few years. The new regulations on financial, financial regulations where the government is going to know even more about your bank account were regulations that were rejected because of a massive writing campaign a couple of years ago. It's called Know Your Customer, and they were knocked down like crazy. And now they're back. They're in. And so these various people, these various players, had their own narrow ends they were trying to achieve. Here was a crisis that was a great excuse to do it. You never want a serious crisis to go to waste. Now. Am I sympathetic with the idea of maybe on the margin cutting back on some civil liberties in order to go after specific cases of terrorism? I am, not in the sense I favor them, in the sense I'm willing to look at them. But that's not what's going on. What's going on is wholesale <clears throat> massive reductions in civil liberties with no focus going after lots of people that has nothing to do with terrorism.